here with, uh, I think it was Countryside. Is Countryside out here? Okay, awesome. Uh, man, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I'm pretty fired up uh, to be here with all of you tonight. I have never been to University of Central Missouri before. Are y'all having a good week? Yeah? Yeah, the humidity. Uh, I made the mistake last uh, today. I didn't iron this shirt, and it still looks a little wrinkly, but the humidity handled it for me. You guys handling the heat all right out here? You doing all right? Okay. Well, hey, once again, my name is Trey Hardeman. Um, I live just outside of St. Louis. Uh, I am married to a wonderful woman by the name of Bailey. She is my sugar mama. I mean, and I, uh, she, is the, she is the best. Uh, and we have two beautiful daughters named Selah, who is three, and Sevi, who is one. And I am a student pastor, so that, that means I legit love you guys, right? I legit love high school students. I love getting to see high school students grow in your faith. I love it when I get to see, right, the switch flip for a high school student, and you finally get it, when you finally understand that Jesus is what is best for you. See, I was 17 years old when Jesus became real to me. I was 17. See, I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't grow up learning all of the stories. When I went to Ozark Christian College, there were so many stories in the Old Testament that I had not heard of that I actually only knew the story of Noah. But I had been transformed by the gospel story. But I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't grow up listening to the stories. I didn't grow up, uh, I didn't grow up watching Veggie Tales. And at this point in time, probably neither did you because you guys are so young. But I know there's some adults in the room who did. I didn't grow up watching Veggie Tales. But maybe you guys did, which is awesome. But man, I had a friend who invited me to a CIY move. And maybe that's you this week. And that opportunity allowed Jesus to meet me uh, where I was at. You see, this organization of CIY means a lot to me that, because this place is where Jesus began transforming my heart. This place is where Jesus began to transform my mind and transform my life. And this week you have and you will continue to have the exact same opportunity that Jesus is attempting to meet you where you are at. And the question that you have to ask yourself is, are you willing to let him? Another reason why I love this place is so much is because this place is where the Bible became real to me. You see, I love this book. I, I love this book's creator, and I love that this book isn't just a collection of stories. I grew up with an English teacher for a mom, and so during the summer, we used to always have to read different books, and uh, we used to read books like Ender's Game and 1984 and The Giver and uh, Monster and all these different books that you read as you were growing up in middle school and high school. I love Harry Potter, I love different books like that, right? Yeah, my one fan right here, I love it, okay. And so, but I love stories. But I love the fact that this book is not just a, a collection of stories, but it's, it's, it's actually something that is, this book is a historical document with real people, with real experiences over the course of 1,500 years. That this book is incredible. And it means the world to me. This book is a life source. It offers a wealth of knowledge and wisdom. And if you have questions, which I know many of us do, it has a direct answer to them or at least a direct principle that you can apply to answer the question. As a student minister, I, I field lots of questions on a regular basis. And I am a firm believer that there are no stupid questions, just stupid people, you know? Um, I'm kidding. Uh, but <laughs> I'm actually not kidding. I, I don't know why I just lied on the stage. But, but high school students, right, you guys love to ask questions. And really, y'all like to ask questions because you really want to know where a line can be drawn in the sand so you can find the loopholes to do what you really want to do. You're not fooling anybody, okay? You're not fooling anyone, right? But one of the questions that I have recently received from some of my students is, is should I watch scary movies with demons in them? or movies that play with demon possession. How many of you guys in the room like scary movies? Raise your hand, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, I'm with, I'm with some of my people here, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, for the most part, do love scary movies, but my answer to this question for my students, whether or not should Christians watch scary movies with demons in them will always and forever be absolutely not, right? Why? Once again, because this book 
isn't just a collection of stories, but a historical document with real people, with real experiences. And this book says a lot about demons, that they are real and they are not to be messed with. So why in the world would I entertain them? Because they're cool? Yeah, y'all can miss me with that. But our story tonight, it deals directly with demons. It's a story where Jesus, he interacts with a a demon-possessed man. But not only does he deal with this man, he saves this man. For our understanding, what is a demon possession as we find it in the Bible? Well, it is to be taken over or to be enslaved and controlled by evil supernatural forces. That as we look at the cases of demon possession in the Bible, there are several things that we notice. The first thing is this. The people tend to have a disregard for personal dignity and nakedness, right? They often engage in destructive behaviors. Number three, they are often uncontrollably angry. Number four, they, the demons, recognize the authority of Jesus and they react with hostility. Number five, they, the demons speak in a voice different from that of the person they occupy. And number six, they often have extraordinary strength. So let me set the scene of the story. Jesus, he's just finished teaching a sermon in parables. And he would have definitely been exhausted as he typically was after teaching uh, for long periods of time. And this is shown, if you read a couple verses earlier, that Jesus has just fallen asleep in the middle of a storm. And as as he's in the middle of this storm, his disciples are spooked. They cannot believe that Jesus is asleep in the middle of this storm. And so, but nevertheless, Jesus, he calms the storm and he and his disciples, they arrive safely on the shore. And scholars say that Jesus and his disciples actually arrive on the shore anywhere between 9 p.m. and midnight. And this is when Jesus meets this man possessed by a demon. And I don't know about you guys, and maybe it's because I have kids now, I, I don't know, but I would have been utterly too exhausted to handle this situation. That there's no way that I would want this particular situation. Can we just wait till the morning and we'll deal with this? But the reality is, is Jesus is ready because he's always ready. Let's look at the story, right? Uh, Luke chapter 8, if you're going to follow along in your own Bible, it will also be up on the screen. Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 27, it says this. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me? Jesus, son of the most high God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirits to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. And though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. There's a couple things that we need to point out here, so we're going to stop here just for a second. Because there's a couple things that uh, jump out to me as the reader immediately when I read this text. The first thing is, this possession made him an outcast. That he potentially was violent and terrified the people in town, which made him an outcast. But these caves... They may have been used as burial sites, that he had been abandoned, that he had been deemed a lost cause, that he didn't know he no longer fit the mold of society, so society had pushed him out. And if you look at the text, it seems very clear that the people don't know what to do with him. So they push him away. The second thing is this demon knows who Jesus is. And it's not Jesus who is afraid, but it is the demon who is afraid. That in the face of this demon, it is the demon who shudders. It is the demon who is afraid. Not the king, not, not Jesus, but the demon who begs Jesus for mercy. And the third thing is this man has been in chains. Chains that others had placed upon him and chains that he had placed probably upon himself to stop him from hurting himself or potentially other people. Time and time again, he's placed chains and he's broken free. He placed chains on himself and then he broke them and they did not work. The demons were way too powerful and strong. They were so strong that he escapes to the caves outside of the village. And the final thing that I think we immediately need to see is the demons led him to solitude. They led him to be alone. 
I mean, we all know that we are the most vulnerable when we are stuck with our own thoughts and our own desires and our own devices. I mean, this man is completely alone. And I don't know if you know this or not, but studies have shown that solitary confinement, it's one of the worst things for a person to experience. Why? Because we lose ourselves in the process. Because we are made to be with other people. We're not meant to be alone. And so Jesus, he meets this man, and this man possessed by demons, and the first words of Jesus written in the text are, what is your name in verse 30? What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And on the surface, this, it seems like a very silly question. Out of all the things for Jesus to say, what is your name does not make sense until you look a little bit closer. That in this moment, Jesus is cool, calm, and collected. You can imagine his disciples, right? You can imagine his disciples. They are exhausted. They are tired. They are definitely afraid. They were just so worried as they were on the sea, and they weren't sure if they were going to survive. And then they are faced with a demon-possessed man, and they are probably so afraid. But Jesus is cool, calm, collected. That he isn't tripping at all in the face of these demons. Why? Because he knows it stands no chance against him. That he knows what's going on. He's no, he knows what's going to happen before it happens. The, in, the whole entire time of this interaction, Jesus is in control because Jesus isn't afraid of the evil that is in this man. So he says, what is your name? What is your name? Basically saying this, I want you to tell me who you are so I can show you who I am am. You believe you have power over this man, but you don't know what power is compared to me. So tell me your name and I will show you who I am. If you read on in the story, moments later, Jesus, right, he, he casts out these demons out of the man into a herd of pigs that rush down the steep bank into the lake and they drowned RIP to the pigs. But these demons did not stand a chance against Jesus. That against the demons, this man didn't stand a chance. But against Jesus, they didn't stand a chance either. Tell me your name, and I will show you who I am. It's not a silly question. Instead, I believe it's a point that all of us in this room need to hear, and it's this. That if you want to be freed from your demons, you must be able to name them. That if you want to be freed from your demons, you must be able to name them. Not just recognize that they exist, but able to call them out for what they truly are. I hope you're getting the point here. Because I know that in this room there are a few people who have potentially interacted with demon-possessed people. And yes, the enemy uses evil spirits and demons to oppress us and harm us. But they, at the exact same time, I believe this story shows us that in our lives there are also demonic presences in this world that the enemy uses to oppress all of us every single day of our life. Things like greed, things like lust, things like pride, things like sexual immorality, things like deceit and laziness and envy and anger. And this sin, it doesn't free us, but it binds us in chains that we are incapable of getting out of on our own. That similar to this man, you, when you think about where you sit right now in this moment, you may feel like an outcast because of your sin. You may feel like you have, have been abandoned or that you are a lost cause because of your sin. That no one will love you or could love you if they knew what you've done in your past. That God can't forgive you. That everyone else's sin is forgivable. That the people to my right and the people to my left, my, their sin is forgivable. But you don't know me, Trey, so how about you just stay out of my life? That There's no way that the sin that I have committed, there's no way that the sin that I have lived through, that God could potentially forgive me. Everyone else's but not mine. You may have tried to stop doing the things that are oppressing you. You've placed chains on you, the, thing, the sins that you tend to commit. You've attempted to stop them. You may have tried to stop looking at some things on your phone. You've put up the blocks on your phone. You've changed the passwords. You may have tried to get out of that relationship or tried to stop doing things with your significant other that you know that you shouldn't be doing. 
You've placed these chains upon yourself, but here you find yourself broken again. You chain yourself up, and then you fall back into sin. You chain yourself up, but then you fall back into sin. You chain yourself up, but then here you are once again, broken. And then also you may feel alone because that's what the enemy does. He wants you alone with your thoughts. He doesn't want you to ask for help. He wants you to suffer. He wants you vulnerable and incapable of getting yourself out of the pit because his sole purpose is to oppress you. To seek, kill, and destroy. His sole purpose is to oppress you. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus isn't afraid of our sins. That Jesus isn't afraid of the evil that is in us. Instead, Jesus longs to free us from our sins. That Jesus, does Jesus care about you? Absolutely. Jesus, he came all the way to earth for you. That when Jesus, he made himself lower than the angels. That Jesus, he decided that he was going to make sure that the people of this world were going to have the opportunity to know him. And so he became a servant in a world in which he deserved to be a king. And he came to this earth for you. That he went all the way to the cross just to prove his love for you. That does Jesus care about the homeless, the poor, or the imprisoned? Does Does Jesus care about those with learning disabilities? Does Jesus care about those who have made big mistakes or small mistakes? He does, and this story proves it. That if you feel like you are the one that has been cast aside or labeled by society, understand that Jesus sees you differently than the rest of the world does. That he does not focus on your failures or your limitations or your flaws. Jesus focuses on your potential. He sees what you were created to be, not what you find yourself as right now. He sees what you can become through his transforming grace and the power of his Holy Spirit. He gives to all who believe. And I believe tonight that Jesus is standing right here in front of us and he's telling you and he's telling me, tell me exactly what's in you. Tell me. Name it. Because just as he said to the legion of demons, he says the exact same to our sin and shame. Tell me who you are, and I will show you who I am. That if you give it over to me, it doesn't stand a chance. That students, Jesus can handle your sin. Jesus isn't afraid of your sin. You may feel like he can't handle it, but I'm here to tell you that he can. But he needs you to name it, and he needs you to hand it over. That the chains that you have placed upon yourself or have been placed upon you will never lead to change. Only Jesus has the power to do that. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. It says this, my grace is sufficient for you. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That you may find yourself here tonight feeling like you are absolutely weak. And I believe that that is fine because we are not called to be strong. Jesus is strong because what Jesus did for us on the cross is show us that no matter what our sin is, no matter how we've fallen short, Jesus tells us to name it and he will show us how strong and how powerful he is. The reality is your sin stands no chance in the face of the Savior of the world. So students, I ask you this. Have you named the evil that is oppressing you? Have you named the evil that is oppressing you tonight? Have you confessed your sin before Jesus? Because I know that there are some of us in this room who feel that we cannot give over our sin to Jesus because he maybe won't love us. And that is the biggest lie that the enemy would love for you to believe. Have you named your sin? Have you confessed your sin before Jesus?
You see, this man in this moment has been afforded the same exact opportunity that we are every single day to be set free from our sins because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. That when Jesus hung on the cross with his nail, with nails in his hands and in his feet, when Jesus took on our sin and our shame for all humanity and rose again from the dead, he gave us the opportunity to be set free. But to be set free, we must name our evil, we must name our sin, cling to Jesus, and stop returning to the chains that repeatedly Find us. That your chains can't save you, only Jesus can. My oldest daughter is, uh, she's three years old and she is the absolute best. She uh, is like me, she is independent, she is opinionated, uh, she is strong willed, and I love her with every fiber of my being. And like most little kids, she has fears. Fears that are typical, like being afraid of the dark, or fears of, of bugs, or fear of being alone. But mo most recently, uh, a fear has become fireworks. Anybody afraid of fireworks in here? Okay, a couple of you, I get that. But, and recently, we, we celebrated the 4th of July, and it was a little bit traumatic for my little girl. And something we do with her when she's afraid, we, we tell her that she can be brave because God is with her. But also not only is God with her, that her dad is with her too. And her dad will protect her. And so picture a, a three-year-old saying this, that, Daddy, I, I, I can be brave. Dad, I can be brave. But a couple of weeks ago, on the 4th, or maybe just before, you know, you know how 4th of July works. People light fireworks off like five days before and five days afterward because they're lunatics. But it's fine, right? And so she, uh, a couple of weeks ago, it got a little bit too much for her. And she couldn't get over the fears on her own. And she even said, uh, she said, Daddy, I can't be brave. And my heart broke. But I walked over to her and I, I picked her up and I held her in my arms and I told her that if you can't be brave, daddy will be brave for you. And I'm not going to lie, it was maybe one of the best dad moments that I've ever had. And it was a moment in which I will remember for the rest of my life. But my little girl didn't have the ability to take away her fear on her own. So I had to help her. And in the exact same way, the story of the demoniac shows us that we fail by our own power to remove the things of our life to get, that get in the way of holy li living. We fail to remove our sin from our life on our own. That it's only through Jesus and his spirit dwelling in us that allows us to begin to make change. But students, there's something that stands in the way of us living in the spirit that frees us. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 13, it says this. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be set free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. And then a couple verses down, it says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, it says this, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so you are not to do whatever you want. What stops me, what stops you, what stops us from experiencing the freedom that Jesus has offered us is the battle that is going on between your flesh and the spirit of God that dwells within you. That what the flesh wants is not what the spirit wants. And what the spirit wants is not what the flesh wants. And not just in actions, but also it's, not, it's, it's different in their desires. That the flesh hinders the fruit of the spirit and the spirit impedes the works of the flesh. That those who live within the means of the flesh desire some things. And those that live in the means of the spirit, they desire others, that we as followers of Jesus are called to live in step with the Spirit, that we are not to do whatever we want or whatever you want, but instead we are to be guided by the Spirit that frees us in the name of Jesus Christ, that when we understand that Jesus has the power to free us, when we understand that Jesus has the ability to set us free in every way, that the devil no longer has a hold over you, we are called to live in step with the Spirit. But the reality is, is in a battle, someone always wins. And I don't know if you know this or not, but Jesus has already won the battle. 
that we actually fight from a place of victory. But between me and you, between us right here at CIY Move 2023, in your own walk with Jesus, there is constantly going to be a battle between your flesh and a battle between your spirit. And you have to decide what is going to win. What is going to win with you? Your spirit or your flesh? And I will say, what will win is what you feed. When I was in high school, I ran cross country and track and field. I was never the best, but I really knew how to push myself, which made me pretty good. And do I have any runners in here? I couldn't see you earlier. Runners in here, make some noise, okay? Well, if you run, you know that it's an extremely mental sport, mental in multiple ways, right? You have to be a certain kind of crazy to run, right? But also, the more mentally tough you are, the better you will be. And growing up, my coach, he would always say that in a race, there's always a a battle going on in your mind between the I can and the I can't, the I can go faster or I can't go faster, the I feel fine or I don't feel fine, the I can't make a move or I can make a move, the my legs feel fantastic or my legs feel like they can't move at all. I can push through this wall or I can't push through this wall and you have to decide what will win. And he used to always say, what will win is what you feed. That if you feed yourself negative thoughts in the race, you don't stand a chance. But if you feed yourself positive thoughts, you might just make it. In the same way, what you feed is what will win in your life, students. But students, my concern is that if you don't know who Jesus is, that if you don't follow Jesus with all of your life, you will be consumed by the flesh. The flesh that only binds you in chains, that we are incapable of getting ourselves out of on our own because the flesh never fully satisfies, that living surrendered to the flesh makes us slaves to sin, that we are incapable of freeing ourselves on our own. But even though we know Christ has died for us, we decide to, instead of surrendering to the Spirit, we will keep on living life in the flesh because it's what I want, because it makes me feel good. It gives me momentary pleasure or instant gratification, forgetting that this choice has huge implications and consequences consequences, but will always leave us to wanting more, leading you into further and further darkness, barring us from entering the kingdom of God. And I don't know about you, but I want to dwell with God forever. But if we choose to live in the Spirit, Jesus has the ability to change how we live because when Jesus is in us, when Jesus takes over our heart, he changes how we live. That when we name our sin, when we lay it at the foot of the cross, when we believe in Jesus, he gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit that has the power to change us from what we were to who we will become. Galatians 2.20, it is one of my favorite verses, and I'm so glad CIY is using it as their theme. But it says this, I have been crucified with Christ. That I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That Galatians 2.20 tells us we are not even the ones living our own lives when we choose to follow Jesus. That Christ is the one living through us. That when we pursue Jesus and open ourselves up to his spirit, he becomes the one who empowers us to change. The change happens by God's spirit living in us and in Paul's words, by childlike steps toward living for him. The spirit is the one who empowers those steps toward godly living that we may fail. Nevertheless, Jesus lives in us. But what does it look like to live in the spirit? Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 through 25, it says this, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. 
That since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That out of the, that consistent surrender to the Spirit flows much fruit. And this fruit is beautiful, right? Out of the overflow of the Spirit comes love. It means that no matter, that no matter what someone has done to us, we won't ever seek anything other than their highest good. It describes the deliberate effort which can only happen through the help of God. That this is a fruit of the Spirit. That out of the overflow of the Spirit comes joy. This is not a joy that comes from earthly things, but it comes from this joy of a person whose foundation is found in God, that out of the overflow of the Spirit comes peace, that, which in this context means that you can have restfulness of heart because there is an understanding that everything is in God's hands, that out of the overflow of the Spirit comes patience, that it has everything to do with dealing with people, that a fruit of the Spirit is being able to be extremely persistent with people. Does that sound like you, student? Does that sound like you? That out of the overflow of the Spirit comes kindness and goodness. That out of the overflow of the Spirit comes faithfulness. That when living in the Spirit, a person can be trusted. Does that sound like you? That out of the overflow of the Spirit comes gentleness. And a famous philosopher, Aristotle, he says it this way, that, that gentleness is the quality of a person who is always angry at the right time and never angry at the wrong time. And finally, out of the overflow of the Spirit comes self-control. This is the Spirit that has mastered its desires and its love for pleasure. This may be one of the most important distinctions of the Spirit, that where the flesh indulges in its desires, the Spirit abstains and dis disciplines its body. But as we finish this list, it's important that, to note that none of these fruits are feelings, but instead all of these are a result of spirit living. You see, fruit is something a plant produces when it's healthy and growing. And the same is true of the fruit of the Spirit because we are created in God's image. Any of us can show love and joy and peace. All of the fruit that Paul mentioned. But Paul is saying that something special happens when we put our faith in Jesus, when we name our sin and we lay it at the foot of the cross and we cling to Jesus. We're not just trying to do these things on our own because we know that we can't save ourselves on our own. And as we grow in our relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit works in our life and these things are a result result of that. Things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that these things are the result of what God's Spirit does in our lives. Just like fruit is evidence of a plant growing, these things are the evidence of what God is doing inside of us to change the world around us. They are what God grows in us as we follow Jesus. That we can show what God is like when we use these qualities. That with God's spirit as our helper, we can live our lives this way. But student, I know that there is some people in this room who have very difficult lives. That you've been dealt a really hard hand. And you are not in control of your surroundings. But us living lives surrendered to the Spirit of God allows us to name our sin, give it over to Jesus, and allow him to work in our lives. Name it. Tell me what you are, and I will show you who I am. Because when we live by the Spirit, we look like Christ. And when we look like Christ, we can change the world around us. Because when Jesus is in us, he changes how we live. I love the end of this story. Because the same message I believe Jesus has for you and for me. That if tonight you are ready to name your sin... If tonight you're ready to lay your sin at the feet of Jesus, if tonight you are ready to take off the chains in which you've attempted to put on yourself, that you, and you are ready to let the spirit of Jesus change you from the inside out, I believe this is what Jesus is saying to you. Luke chapter 8, verse 39, it says this. Return home and tell how much God has done for you. Will you pray with me? God, we love you and we praise you. God, we are undeserving of the grace in which you offer us. What we learn from your grace is that you are the greatest, 
that you deserve all the praise, that you are worthy of our worship, that you deserve our understanding, that you did not have to die, but you chose to die for us, that we have the opportunity to be set free because of what you've done for us on the cross. That no matter how broken we feel inside, no matter are the chains in which we have bound ourselves in, no matter the sin in which we have committed, no matter the sin in which we have experienced, no matter what, God, you tell us to name it and you will show that sin who you are. That no matter what is inside of us, God, you say that you're not afraid of it. And so, God, tonight we are, we are in awe of you. We are thankful for you. And we ask that you will move in our hearts tonight. That you will show us who you are. And through your spirit, you will change how we live. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen.